And I noticed you produced all these records too. Did you ever consider having an outside producer? Uh, that's a very good question. I have, mm, you know, uh, back in the day, me and Victor Bailey worked together on Alex Munoz records. I've produced a lot of Alex's records or some of his most popular records anyway. Um, but no, you know, there's just like, uh, you know, that one song that Marcus did that, I mean, essentially he just gave me the track so that was his, his production. Uh, I arranged it a little more. But no, you know, I never, I've never, I've never thought about it. I, I don't think that, um, I don't think I'm popular enough that I'd be able to get a producer who's going to spend as much time working on a thing as I would myself. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, I mean, I spend hours like, you know, working on a song or editing a song or, you know, trying different sounds. You know, I mean, I have a, this huge keyboard bundle, you know, I'll go through every mini move sound, you know, looking for the perfect background part sound, you know. So you're um, meticulous. Yeah, I'm, I put, yeah, I, I, I really am. You know what I mean? And, and it's, you know, I had, I had a drum teacher. His name was uh, Michael Carvin. So Michael worked with Freddie Hubbard and a whole bunch of other people. And he was one of the last, uh, the, the later stages when Motown moved to L.A., he was one of their session drummers. But he said, you know, Poochie, people don't realize that the word record literally means that, that you're recording something that's going to become a part of your legacy. It's something that's going to be an archive, something that's a recorded document in time. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to do something and have your name on it and not have it be the best it, it can be. Because someone will like look you up and go back and, you know, they're going to listen to your music and they're going to be basing who you are on that music long after you're gone. So you owe it to yourself and, and your legacy to try to make the best, the best stuff humanly, humanly possible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, may, it makes me feel good that you could tell the difference between thinking outside the box and get on the kit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know? Definitely. Uh, I did find it uh, surprising when I first encountered it. You have the song "Creeping" on there, but it's not the Stevie Wonder song. It's it's a different. No, that was that, that's the song that Marcus wrote. Yeah, that's Mar That's Miller Miller's song. He didn't name it that. I did, and I can't remember why I named it that. I can't remember why I named it that. No, but it's not. It's not. It's not the Stevie. They're not the Stevie song. Yeah. Um. So when you put together this record and you are now, you know, this was 2007, what were your aspirations with it? Did you hope to uh, get airplay? Did you hope to just have, um, you know, stuff for repertoire for performing? Did you hope to, you know, really turn a nice profit or what were your aspirations? Well, uh, before the Cirrus and XM and all that, whatever they call it now, before they just had, before they had watercolors, they had a thing called Beyond Jazz. So that record lived on Beyond Jazz, you know what I mean, for a, quite a long while, even in like in a recurring kind of playlist thing. Um, so I was happy about that. Uh, there's a song on there called Funky Helmet. Um, I just recently got a very, 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 very large publishing check. And some television show in Japan uh, ended up using that song for something. And I, I have, you know, I have ASCAP right now, in fact, trying to chase down the people so I can send them a thank you note because I was like, Are you sure this is not a mistake, you know, kind of size of a check. So, I, you know, so I guess, you know, my, my hope is always the same is to, to be able to work independently you know, to be able to support my family by not have, having to be a sideman or a session guy in, in somebody else's thing. You know, uh, I think one of the most important lyrics that have, was ever written or sung by uh, anyone was by Billie Holiday, where she said, God bless a child that has their own. 
And I, I just truly believe in that. You know, if you have your own thing, they, no one can take that away from you. If you're working with a hit artist, say, say you got the gig with Sting or somebody like that. Well, it's all gravy if the guy's working. But if he decides that he doesn't feel like working right now, what are you, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? So the, the goal for me is always the same thing, to, to, to be able to work. <laughs> and also to show people that just because you play drums doesn't mean that you can't be musical and you can't produce and you can't write and you can't do this. I've had people come up to me after a gig and say, well, I'd like to buy your record, but what's on it? Just drums? You know, I mean, just like say all sorts of weird stuff. And I go, no, you mean, there's, there's just history of drummers who've made records. Maybe not all of them are good, but, you know, there's guys who play drums who make records. Plenty you know of them. I mean? So I guess that, you know, to, if, you know, if, to be able to support my, my family doing what it is I love to do on my own is always the goal behind behind these records, you know. And is your... Is your father still with us? Oh no, my 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 dad my dad passed away uh, uh, the same the same week that I was mastering the Sugar Top record. And my dad died in December of 2012. Okay, well he was with us for a good while though, and uh, how how did he um, react to your success in a professional? Music? He we we did our relationship wasn't necessarily the best let's just put it put it put it that way um my father was was a i i think that he might have been bipolar um and um I mean, you, you know, you know I mean, I love I love the man madly and 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 the musical education I got living in his house, I wouldn't have gotten any place else. But towards, you know, when I was finally, like, on my own, our relationship just kind of deteriorated. So for a long, long, long time, we, we just didn't speak to each other, you know? And when I had my son, I reached out to him, and I, and I tried to make amends, um, or find some resolve, you know what I mean? That didn't happen. So uh, for a long time, we, we didn't speak. So I, I have no idea what he thought or what he didn't think, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's one of those things in life, you know what I mean? You know, you, you wish you could, you, you had a time machine, and you wish there's some way that you could uh, write, write the boat, but you can't. I'm sorry to hear that, but if you're like me, and I'm sensing you are, um, you're more than making up for that with your own son. Oh, yeah. Which but, you I know, too. but you know what's interesting? You know what's interesting? So, but to him, right? So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm making sure that, you know, I'm there and, do, you know, doing all the things, you know, that I wish my dad had done. You know, He doesn't know thing. different, though. Yeah, but but to him, it's just like, oh, you're just dad. You know, yeah. that's what that's what dad does. You know what I mean? I mean, but I, you know, I I know someday when he when he's grown and and he has a family of his own, you know, I know I know he'll he'll look back and say, wow, you know, I I get it now. You know, I I, I in my heart of hearts, I, I truly believe that. Oh yeah, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. Um, and we were talking off air, but your son is also musical, so. Yeah, he he uh, is an amazing saxophone player. He plays sax, he plays bass, he plays keyboards. Um, on my current record, he's been working with me uh, doing the production. So I guess I do have an outside producer at this time. Um, but he's been playing, he, he has played bass, sax, keyboards on my record. Uh, he's come up with arrangements. He has, uh, has done additional production. He's my soundboard. You know, if I I call up says, "Hey man, listen to this. What do you think?" You know, it's like, "Oh, dad, that one's good. That one's not so good." You know, type of thing. Um, you know, and he has his, uh, he's a part of a band called the Funky Fly Project. He, you know, they did like seventy nine shows last year. They did about eighty shows this year. They opened for uh, 
Kenny G and Gerald Albright and all those type of people and down down south and and, sh- and Charlotte, North Carolina, they played the Jazz Festival. And um, they've opened for Corey Henry. They've opened for Confunction. Later on this, no, next year, they're opening for Lakeside and I can't remember another group. But anyway, so yeah, so he has a, a career. They, you know, they're about to release their second album. Um, uh, he's also working on a solo record for himself. He's writing and producing and doing all the stuff on. And uh, so he's a he's a talent much you know much more talented guy than me. He is you know <laughs> great great great, great sight reader, great sight reader. You know, clear understanding of theory and harmony and um. Like all the stuff I ignored, <laughs> he he has he he you know, slowly but surely is mastering. Uh, he just got a saxophone endorsement. Uh, my buddy Najee gave him a saxophone endorsement. And he's endorsing Barry Reed's uh, company's Reed's, and so he's he's on he's on his way. He's on have, his way. Have you lent any drums to any of his recording? Uh yeah, yeah. I played. Uh, you know, he's, a lot of his stuff is program stuff, so he's singing on some stuff and rapping on some stuff, but he's has some stuff that he's just playing his horn on, so the stuff he played his horn on, I play drums on, yeah. yeah. Hey, definitely look out for that, too. Yeah. Um, so, back to, to your records, uh, My America came out next in 2010, wow. and um, what what changed for you, would you say, from you know, the kit record to, to this one? Um, the band changed. Personnel changed. Um, we had done a couple of tours of Europe with the new personnel um, in the band. And uh, I guess you know, conversations I was having with other musicians about different things. And so like, for me, that record was a little more uh, organic kind of kind of record. You know, it has more blues kind of flavors in it. And uh, so, yeah, I just guess my musical posture on different things. I just started looking different and different directions at different things and but still trying to reach that hippie that hippie crowd and that hippie audience, you know. Um, I think the problem with jazz and smooth jazz and, and all that stuff is that there's no young people coming to it. You know what I mean? Um, in order for any music to move forward and survive, you got to have young folks, you know. So the, the hippie kids, uh, you know, who are listening to Soul Live and Snarky Puppy and Robert Glasper and and um, they 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 are the future of of what that instrumental music what it's going to be is in that world at least that's my most most humble opinion you know the smooth jazz thing you know, so the Sirius XM you know the, those people you know they may have nine hundred thousand active listeners a day that's a good thing you know it's, it's you know it's real. But the audience is just growing older. And you got to think, you know, a lot of things they're calling jazz festivals now are artists from the late 90s, but they're calling like Brian McKnight and Erica Badu and Frankie Beverly and Mays, and they're going to call that a jazz fest. You know, or, they have, or sometimes they call it a funk fest too, and they're not really funk bands. Well, you know, or yeah, and that, and that, and that too. And, you know, and, um, so I don't know, you know, I think that in, in order in order for any any music to survive, I guess my point is it, you, you have to be doing something to attract young, fresh ears and listeners to it. So, you know, hopefully one of the young people goes, oh, I think that's cool. I want to do this, too. And the music keeps going on. Yeah. You know, you know. Well, we'll spread the word through what you're doing right now. That'll help. Um, did you do any. uh, uh Dates with people like Soul Live or um, any of those type of acts? Uh, not, not, I mean, I, you know, I know all those guys, but to, I'm, I'm, you know, to those guys, I'm, I'm like, oh, you know, they, they, you know, I'm, I'm like the old guard, you know what I mean? 
Um, I know Mike Lee real well from Snarky Puppy and, you know, I get, you know, or, you know, Spud, Spud and Ghost Note and all those guys, you know, so they, they show me a lot of respect and, 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 you know, give me my props and everything. Or like Stanton Moore's thing from Galactic. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stan, I don't, I don't know him personally, but I know, I know, I, you know, I know who Galactic is, obviously, and, and, and his band. And so, you know, in that world, you know, or Adam Dice or whatever, um, break science, but I haven't worked with a lot of those guys, but I know all those guys, all those guys grew up listening to me and play with Marcus, you know what I mean? Right. And, um, so they're always very, very cool, very, very respectful of me when, when, when I'm around them or have conversations or interactions with them. And that's, that's nice. You know, it's nice to be appreciated and nice to know that someone actually was paying attention when you were in their age and in your heyday. You know what I mean? Well, um, I think look, if, you're, if your son, who's a young guy, can be on a bill with a confunction or lakeside, I don't see why you can't be on a bill with some of these younger you know, fusion jam bands. Just, just, well, the, working, the, the majority of the time when I am touring and working, I, it's usually a, a, over across the water. So maybe with this, this new record, uh, I might be able to find more of a, uh, you know, we might, there might, there potentially might be more work available. You know, the, 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 the unique thing about that, that world is that you have to be willing to keep going uh, and going and going and going regardless of what the gig pays. Now, so if you're a young guy, you know, you don't have a family to support and so forth and so on, that's fine. You know, like Starkey Puppy guys came straight out of college. You know, they play wherever and they would sleep on somebody's floor. Uh, I'm too old to be sleeping on somebody's living room floor. Sure. And yeah. and if I and, and if I go to the gig, I I have to make, uh, I have to get paid, you know. So to take a four piece band on the road in America f and to play a club that only wants to pay you five or six hundred bucks, and have to do that for six or seven years before you start making good money, is for for a guy in my age group, that's not that's not apropos. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know it's too I mean? bad. Yeah. The, the reality of economics uh, interferes with good music sometimes. <laughs> oh, uh, often. Yeah. Often. Uh, were you trying to be a little more political with, you know, the My America title? and? Uh, I, I, I guess, you know, I, and on a, to, a certain, to, a certain, to a certain extent, at least with the, with the cover art, and and uh, you know when you, when you think about the the level a lot of times of things that I don't really want to necessarily call it injustice, but things that just simply that aren't just, you know, um, and and they, they go on on a on a on a daily basis and have been going on way before our current administration and so forth and so on. Um, yeah, so I, I felt at least if nothing else with the cover art, I wanted to uh, express my my views on it. But, you know, the front covers, that's my son when he was very small and then my mom on the front porch of, her, of, the, of the whole family house and my wife is on that cover. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of people made uh, uh <laughs> A big, a big whoop about the inside picture when it has the, the the Ku Klux Klan guy being uh, saved or uh, attended to by all black staff, you know. And I just thought about the, the for me that was more about the irony of 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 life itself and and the fact that uh, we're, this whole thing is very very fragile. So when you start, you know, they. Now, I, I can't be around you because you, this your color, your skin, or this is your religious belief, or all those different kind of things. When it boils right down to it, if you know, uh, if you were in need and you needed help, you don't wouldn't care where the help came from. So one last thing about my America, I wanted to mention uh, the track Sparks. I really like that one. It's got like really cool textures and sonic 
qualities right. on that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's Bobby Sparks. You know, Bobby Sparks. He's a, he's an amazing he's an amazing musician. If you if, you, if, you, if your listeners or your viewers don't know who Bobby Sparks is, you need to find him on on Spotify and listen to his last record. He's he's an amazing guy. You know, we played together in Marcus Miller's band for a long, long time. I met him when he was working with Roy Hargrove, and he's just another one of those great musicians that comes from Texas. You know. Another one of those great Texas guys. Actually, um, I guess I went out of sequence on that one, though. That one came after, actually. We went over uh, um, on Shuffle. Oh, right, right, right. So Shuffle, on Shuffle was 09. That one was 2010. So, right. Yeah. Shuffle, Shuffle uh, it was a, the, also a guy who was a keyboard player in Marcus's band. His name was Bruce Flowers. And um, we had a band called Bellflower. So the first time I went to Japan uh, on my own was with as a version of Bellflowers. And so me and Bruce had worked on a record, and the record had everybody and their mother on it. More, you know, just kind of conceptually like what I'm doing with this one. So we had Kenny Garrett, we had Wallace Rooney, we had Hiram Bullock, we had Ron Carter, we had. Uh, Gerald Albright, we had Layla Hathaway, we had Layla Hathaway, Marcus Miller, David Sanborn, uh, Dean Brown, all on one track, you know, and I went to Blue Note to try to get a deal, and they only offered me 30 grand, right, and of hindsight, it's 2020, I, I should have took the 30 grand, right, because I'd still be putting out records on Blue Note, but I, I, I turned it down, and we never put the record out. So I had all these tracks with all these great musicians on them. I was like, well, I got to do something with this. So uh, meanwhile, I started working on some other stuff uh, at the studio, just like randomly making track. Like there's a song on there called Miss Alice and a couple of other songs, uh, Joe Berg and stuff like that, uh, which were just experiments. So I just said, you know what? I got four or five of those songs, experiment songs, and I got these songs that me and Bruce did, I'm just going to put them all together and put it on a record and put it out. And so that's how you get Pooji on Shuffle. Hmm. And that's, you seem to have a penchant for uh, most of the songs that you do are very concise, short titles. Yeah, well, you know, you get short, straight, to the point. <laughs> <laughs> less for people to think about. <laughs> Theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, so the sugar top was the next uh like full-fledged full-blown uh, yeah fuji experience um yeah and um another uh one of your stronger records i think too i uh yeah definitely that and probably the most commercially uh successful um I did very, very. I never released it in America, and I'm actually thinking about doing it this Christmas. But in Europe, uh, the distributors re it got reordered like two or three times, which is pretty amazing. And um, so it, it did very, very well. You know, it charted over there, and uh, man, people seem to really seem to gravitate to that record for whatever reason. But I, I think the re you know it has a strong, strong R and B and funk thing with it. You know what I mean? And I, you know, it's had some some good vocals on there. I did a couple couple covers, and um, so it lent it lends itself as a very listener friendly record. And also, you know, the the, the mixes on that record really came out pretty good and this was the also the first time um that i used the this mastering company uh in europe um sky sky lab or something like that but they're geniuses they're they you know so sonically it sounded good the, the cover art I thought, I thought had a nice vibe to it but you know that record that record did well that the record did well. Um, what's I going to say? Uh, 
I noticed too, um, you're talking about your new one having so much music, but you've right. always been like really generous on how much you put on these CDs. I mean, they're mostly packed with a lot of music. You know, some people put out 30, 40 minute discs. You've got a, long, a lot of playtime on these. Well, you know, I figure at least, you, you know, if you, if you go play a gig, a proper gig lasts for about an hour and 10, 15 minutes. Right, I mean, unless you're Bruce Springsteen or Prince, and people want you to stay on stage, or Stevie Wonder, or somebody, or George, but you know, you, you at least want to give some people uh, something that you know they feel that they if they spent their hard earned cash, or even if they streamed it or got it off of YouTube for free, but that there's some there's something there of substance, you know what I mean, and um, and it's something that's indicative of what you would do at the gig. You know, that I would, you know, give give the people, you know, an hour and 20 hour, 30 minute show, you know. Well, we fans and listeners appreciate that. Um, I never could get, you know, when you see critics, like they'll knock an artist for putting too much on a CD. Like, oh, if they would have made it, you know, this length shorter, it would have been a masterpiece. But because they put on more stuff, suddenly right. it denigrates the whole thing. I, I don't go with that. Well, you know, for this on this current record, I've I've had I've had that conversation. You know, some people are for you know, but there's definitely people who are definitely against, you know, and think what you just said. You know, and, well, it's too much, you know, and people's attention spans. You're not going to be able to hold them, and this, that, and the other. It's like, well, maybe, maybe not. You know, people can you know? skip a track if they want to. Hello. <laughs> um. So, ironically, then, My America was your last domestic release? The last record that I put out in America, yeah. Well, the last one, the exhibition continues, I think might have been available in America. But, again, you know, the record company really dropped the ball on that one. So, you know, they, the, the, the time they released it and, the fact that they didn't really make any announcements or do in, literally anything. So, but I, I think that you can get the exhibition continues on Amazon and blah, 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 blah. Um, the My America record, not the My America record, the Sugar Top record, I think it only would be available at like Amazon, EU or UK or, you know, iTunes, Japan, blah, blah, blah that, that sort of thing, you know. So I guess theoretically, my America could have been, but I think it's the last one. Exhibition continues. Would have been in the last American uh, release. All right. Well, so it was if even if that was the case, it was like an eight-year, uh, you know, gap between domestic releases. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good, Scott. Well, the not good, good thing is that, you know, you're already got a new one coming um, so quickly. So, um, yeah. so you think you, you think in, uh, did you say earlier February release or later in that? Or? Um, I think they're going to uh, get it out. I would have to think like very, very early spring, like in April or May, because I have to turn the record in and we're going to mix the record in December. Uh, you have to have some, you know, some setup time, turnaround time. So, you know, I'm thinking early April, you know, will be when they when they put it out. Because I'm, you know, I'm trying to coincide it so that I'll be able to go over there and do some shows in the spring, and I should be able to go back in the summer and do a few festival gigs and do a full fledged tour in the fall. You know, and uh, now the record company has, you know, proper, you know, everything is set up right now whatever wasn't set up right before everything is set up right now and they um also have uh good distribution here in america i just have to decide whether or not i want to do that part of it 
more than likely I will, but I have to look at exactly what they're, you know, I think they had worked out something with Sony or Universal, but I think Sony and Universal are the same thing now. I can't remember. No, but they have some distribution here in America now with some promotion money behind it. So we'll see. You think you might do any shows stateside or that's kind of a wait and see? That's always just a wait, a wait and see, you know, because my music isn't smooth jazz music. It falls between a bunch of different kind of places and cracks. Um, well, I'm very glad for that, by the way. I don't want to, you know, not get well, anyone. But. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Um, but so I don't know. We just, I just have to wait, wait and see how things materialize themselves. I mean, I would love to be able to not have to go to an airport and catch a plane and ride it for six or seven hours to, to work. But um, whatever the reality that I find myself in is the reality that I'm going to make work for myself. So if it turns out that I'm able to work in America, but sure, I'll, I'll, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to, you know, Cleveland's a whole lot closer to Pittsburgh than Germany. You know, <laughs> I've noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so we'll see. I hope I'm, I'm. You know, hope I'm hopeful and pray and, pray and prayerful that that will happen. Yeah, we're all hopeful. Well, at the very least, if you don't, make sure and post some of those on YouTube for for. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so, going to wrap this up. Before I do, I want to ask you, what might be on your bucket list musically that you haven't yet done that you might like to accomplish? Well, I wanted to work with Prince, but that's not going to happen, unfortunately. Um, I would like to be able to play some of the big major festivals and venues that I've done with other artists. I'd like to do that and be able to do that on my own. Um, that would be most awesome. Um, other than that, I really don't, I don't. I, I, you know, again, and I sound like a broken record, but I've been so fortunate and so blessed with all the different musical situations that I've had. I've, 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 I have traveled the world. I have seen things that most people just dream about, you know? So I don't, I don't, I can't say, well, if, you know, if I just, just do this one thing, then that'll be it. And I can, I could go. You know, God can call me home and I, and I won't go kicking and screaming. Um, but I, if, 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 but if anything, it would be able to play, you know, the play the Mont, you know, the, the, the Montreux Jazz Festival or, you know, play, play North Sea Jazz Festival, be able to play, you know, the New Orleans Heritage Jazz Festival, uh, to be able to play a, a big, a big fest and, or, or you know, play a nice theater, um, and just do it on my own steam. That's about, about the only thing that I can think of, you know. For something like that, or even when you go overseas for your next uh, live shows, um, what do you anticipate your repertoire or your set list would be like? I mean, how much do you pull from all those records we talked about, and do you do other stuff too? I figured out probably the most important thing, at least for me. So I go up and I play five instrumentals. And I take, you know, I always find a guy who plays the hell out of an instrument but can sing. Right? And then, um, like, the last tour that I did a couple years ago, I had a guy named Mike Stephens who played saxophone but he's an amazing singer like sings like Donnie Hathaway and he's amazing and um we played you know songs from my records and stuff and but you know then we did like uh Blackbird by the Beatles you know we did you know some you know on um exhibition continues record I, I covered the Sam uh Cook song uh change is going to come you know what I mean so we do, you know, a mixing and matching, but 
having a vocalist at the gig, you know, makes the evening a whole lot uh, more malleable for an audience. You know what I mean? So you have people there who like instrumental music, but you have a whole bunch of people who probably got dragged to the show by somebody who said, oh, you got to see this. This is good. Right. So for those people, when the guy starts singing, it makes it like, oh, OK, you know, I, I know who the Beatles are, you know, <laughs> something that can. Yeah. Latch yeah, on. yeah. So you try to you try to give something for everybody because you want to see smiling faces at the end of the show, smiling face at the end of the show means a potential CD cell. You know, so I mean, my whole thing is about being pragmatic. I don't go up on the stage and, you know, play 5,000 drum solos in a night. You know, did I, I, that's, you know, if so, what happens a lot of times with instrumental music is the musicians end up just playing to musicians, right? Problem with that is musicians we're going to critique your work, but they're never going to buy your music. You know, so you want to be, you want your music to be able to, to appeal to the soccer mom, you know, and just to the everyday person, you know, I mean, I've had people, you know, with my, when I was doing the hippie thing and I would do, you know, shows here in America. So I had people come up to me and say things like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't like jazz. I don't like jazz at all, but I like what it is that you do. You know, those type of things are what you live for. You know what I mean? Because you you touch the person uh, with, with with your sound and with your music. You know what I mean? So yeah, all right. So I guess that would be my but that would be my bucket list to touch to touch the ever, average day Joe and Jane and to play uh, with my music and and to be able to play the big shows and you know, I played in Madison Square Garden, but to be able to play there on my own, ooh, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> or to play at Lincoln Center or play at Carnegie Hall in New York, you know what I mean? Or um, Beacon Theater or, you know, uh, you know the, the, the Universal Amphitheater, you know, in L.A. And, you know, to be able to do that on my own and, and to be picking up, because the only way that can happen is if I pick up the average Joe and Jane person, because those are the type of, you, you got to have a lot of those people who would buy a ticket to come to your show in order for that to happen. Yeah. So I guess that would be my goal. Are you, are you still continuing to uh, play sessions? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, you know, I said, I mean, I, with the, having the studio here in my house um, makes that easy. You know, every once in a blue moon, you know, Somebody calls you and you go to a studio like the movie thing I did not too long ago. Uh, there's a really, really nice studio here in Pittsburgh. And they're always doing movies or alternative rockers and stuff like that. So when they need live drums, they usually call me to come play, which is very kind of them. Um, but, you know, I'm not in New York. I'm not in Los Angeles where a lot of that work would happen on a more of a regular basis. That work that, work that still exists. You know, but, you know, I do OK. People send me some stuff to play on a record here and there. And that's fun. I enjoy it. You know? Yeah, I mean, on my list of um, stuff, the last big name that I saw you worked with was was Marcus back in 2011. So I don't know if you've done other major artist sessions since then, but. Uh... Uh, well, people who might end up someday being a major artist, put it to you that way. Um, but I guess the last, besides his, his thing, I, you know, I did some sessions with Anjali Kijo, uh, African singer. And one of the records that I did, you know, it had, um, Josh Gobon on it and had Carlos Santana and had all these Big wigs that I didn't know were going to be on a record. If I had Ziggy Marley, if I had known, I probably would have charged him more money. <laughs> but it won a, it won a Grammy for best contemporary world album or something like that. So I've done a couple 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 of her records, you know. But again, you know, but that's when I was still living in New York. You know what I mean? 
Well, no. Yeah, I wasn't living in New York at the time, actually. I, I went up there to go do those records. But, you know, if you're going to be that kind of guy, you, you have to be where that game is. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't live in, in New York anymore, and I don't live in Los Angeles. So, you know, somebody thinks of me, you send a track, you know, on we transfer, and I, I put, it, put it in my computer, play the, play the drums. They put the money in the PayPal, keep it moving. So the jazz fusion scene and uh, the Pittsburgh areas and all that. <laughs> the 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 music scene here is there are a bunch of great players for sure, but like most cities, you know, I mean New York and L.A. are both bigger, but this Pittsburgh suffers from the same thing. There's not as half as many places to play live music um, as there were. You know, and the places that are, uh, or very few places to cater to what it is that I like, I like to do. You know what I mean? It's like I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'll listen to it, but I'm probably not, you know, I'm, I don't see myself getting called for a heavy metal gig anytime soon, or, you know, <laughs> some young college rock band gig. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. You know, well, but you know, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a long history uh, and tradition of, of great jazz musicians, and uh, and you know, slowly but surely, we're turning into a tech town like San Francisco. You know, with Google and all the Uber and all this crap. So I don't know. Next ten years or so, who knows? You know, it might turn into a, a hotbed of, of creativity. You know, you never know. But right now, it's it's okay. You know, I work around town very sp sparsely, just to be honest, you know, and I, you know, I have people who, you know, when I was a little tiny kid and went to elementary school here, uh, so I have some childhood friends who are musicians. If they call me and ask me to play, I go play, you know what I mean? But, you know, the gigs don't, they don't pay very much and, um, I, you know, it's more worthwhile for me to be working on my own music or be working on a production or trying to write a song or something that's going to help move me forward as opposed to going and, you know, going to the club and, and playing around about midnight, you know, it's just eh, been there, done that, you know? Yeah. Well, look, you're making a record. Exactly. Like we talked about, so yeah. yeah. But it's a great place to raise a kid. It's a great place to raise a kid. Cost of living is low. Um, so I'm not mad at Pittsburgh. Just, you know, it is what it is. But there's a lot of cities like Pittsburgh. Great, great sports, them. great sports town. Yeah. Oh well, well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on which Sunday you're watching football. Yeah. <laughs> And we don't definitely don't want to talk about baseball. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, believe it or not, I grew up. I'm a lifelong Pirates fan. Okay, okay. So, okay. well, they were good once. You know. Yeah, we are family. It's '79 was the last time. Yeah, it's been well, a they were good in the early '90s too, but yeah, yeah. For a hot minute, you're right. They were. They were. Uh, Fuji, um, I really appreciate all this time and you know oh, my pleasure. I'm sorry it took so long to get it done. Thank you uh, on behalf of myself for all the great music you've given us and continue to do so and for all the listeners and viewers of the show. Thank you very much. God bless you for being and doing this. I appreciate you. Hey, back at Truth and Rhythm headquarters. Thank you for joining us on another magical ride with Truth and Rhythm. Whether you're watching or listening, as always, thank you so much for your continued interest and support. Be sure to subscribe. Go to YouTube. Go to the Funk and Stuff channel. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives and breathes and thrives. Also, goodies here like TIR Quick Takes. And if you subscribe, you know what? You get the show before anyone else. It's free. If you love jazz, funk, R&B, soul, you can't miss it. Pass it along. Tell a friend. Tell family. This audience is growing and it is a beautiful thing all coming together 
for the love of this great music. Also, if you can throw us a buck or two, we could use the support financially, keeping the lights on, keeping the servers going, all these expenses. If you can help support the program, whatever you can give, much appreciated. Go to the FunkinStuff.net website, and on the right-hand side of every page, you just click and you can donate through PayPal, credit card, whatever. Very easy to do and so much appreciated. And if you do a sizable donation, I will mention you on the program. Also, drop me a line. Email me at scottg at funkinstuff.net. Let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you enjoy about the music. Let's just kibitz and uh, talk about stuff, you know, talk music. You'll find that I respond very quickly, and I much enjoy the uh, rapport and the camaraderie and the interaction. Always remember, this is your show, The True Music Lover. So for now, that's all the time we have for this one. It's a wrap. As always, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one. <laughs>